Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, my name is Brian Fishman. I'm a counterterrorism research fellow here at the New America Foundation. And I really have the, the pleasure today of hosting uh, three uh, of our leading scholars looking at terrorism uh, centered around the release of Jake Shapiro's new, wonderful new book, The Terrorist Dilemma. Uh, Jake is a assistant professor, assistant professor uh, at Princeton University. He's the co-director of a project called the Empirical Studies of Conflict Project. This brings together a range of, research, of academics uh, from around the country that are doing empirical work. Uh, and what's really powerful about this empirical academic work they're doing is that they have managed to do rigorous academic empirical work that is also policy relevant, and that is no small task. Um, and, and Jake really is at the leading edge of a community of scholars that uh, is doing this. All three of these people, too, um, I have quite a bit of history with. Um, we all, in various ways, were deeply involved in the early days at a place called the Combating Terrorism Center uh, at West Point, uh, which is a place certainly deep in my heart. Some of the early reports there, you may not know um, Jake's name, but a lot of the early work there, the conceptual work that drove um, you know, the, the early Harmony reports, Harmony and Disharmony, uh, that involved the release of, of previously classified documents um, and really gave us insight into Al-Qaeda as an organization. Um, you'll see sort of a chain of custody of some of those ideas, I think, through to Jake today and the work in this book. And he, that has certainly been influential on me personally for quite a long time. So, um, Jake, thank you very much for being here. Um, I barely need to introduce Bruce Hoffman, who is here as a discussant. Um, Bruce leads the Center for Security Policy at Georgetown and the Security Studies program there. He is one of the nation's, uh, and has been one of the nation's leading scholars on counterterrorism, um, really one of our top experts, and, and one of the few people, I think, that had a perspective on, on Al-Qaeda uh, on 9-11 that was an informed perspective. So um, thank you very much, Bruce, for being here. Last week, lastly, Will McCants, who has a new title. Uh, he's a new fellow at the Brookings Institution, which is an organization I don't know if you've heard of. The, uh, he's also the director of uh, U.S. Interaction with the Islamic World, and, uh, which is close at least, uh, and is also somebody that had a sort of a deep influence on the thinking of the Combating Terrorism Center. So um, it's very much uh, a, a fun day for me to bring those folks together um, around the great work that Jake has done. So without further ado, Jake, please. Start us off. Thanks, Brian. Um, so, so thank you guys for hosting this. Um, it's really kind of great to be here with you guys. And, and Bruce, thank you very much for, uh, for, for coming to talk with us. What I want to do today is um, start off by discussing a few, uh, I guess, puzzling observations about what goes on inside terrorist groups and kind of motivate these with some of the documents that uh, Brian was talking about from the Harmony database. And then give, try and give you, in a, in a relatively brief way, uh, a way to think about these documents and put them in perspective that I think is also useful for thinking about why we see <coughs> such a broad range of organizational models among terrorists, right? You see everything from kind of uh, relatively loosely organized, what, what Louis Bream, a white, uh, a white nationalist uh, leader in the United States, called leaderless resistance, where you have one person who's advocating a particular ideology, and the idea is lots of people independently do what they want to groups like Al-Qaeda, which at points in its history was very much trying to become uh, what we would think of as a normal bureaucratized organization. So we see this big range, and I want to try and give you a way to think about that. And then the last thing I want to do is discuss some of the implications of this for policy and for thinking about uh, what should be done to deal with groups, and also how serious of a problem are they? How should we rank them in the set of national security threats? Uh, and so that's the agenda. And uh, the, the starting observation, so there are kind of two I want to start with is that there's a tremendous amount of disagreement and strife and disorder within many terrorist organizations. So going back to Narodnya Volia in Russia in the, in the 1880s, uh, terrorist groups have frequently had lots of internal disputes. And this follows through to, to Al-Qaeda today. And I want to show you uh, a couple examples of this. So sometimes the disputes are over things like how to spend money. So, so this is a letter that was first published in the Atlantic Monthly, uh, Alan Cullison. Uh, Wall Street, actually in the Wall Street Journal, a Wall Street Journal reporter uh, happened uh, to break his laptop as he's covering the invasion of Afghanistan and went to the market in Kabul to buy a used laptop and miraculously, fortuitously ended up buying Zawahiri's laptop. 
Uh, and in the couple hours before John and Mike showed up at his door to say, hey, we'd like to take that away for a little while, he and his colleagues downloaded a whole bunch of the materials on it. And this is one of the letters that Zawahiri had written to folks in Yemen in 1999. And in this letter, he kind of castigates them for 11 points on how they're spending money, including like you bought a used fax machine, you bought a new fax machine when there's a perfectly good used one. And the recipient of this letter writes back, that was also in the files Cullison and his colleagues found, to say, look, if you're going to micromanage me that way, I quit. And so it's maybe not surprising that you would have disagreements over money in these groups, because maybe they're resource constrained, maybe budgets are tight, and so on and so forth. Um, but you also see disagreements over tactics. So this is a letter that actually I think Brian found, or at least wrote about first, uh, in a report for the, the Combating Terrorism Center, which was picked up on a pen drive on an Al-Qaeda in Iraq fighter in 2006. And it was written in 2005 uh, to Abu Osama, who led uh, an AQI cell in Ramadi. And one of the guys I went to grad school with served in Ramadi in late 2005 and remembers going out on raids to try and get this guy. But basically in this letter, more senior leaders in Al-Qaeda in Iraq are writing to him and saying, look, uh, we agree with you on the people that you're killing. They need killing, and that's good. But you need to stop doing it in this really gruesome way in the town square because you're pissing off the locals, and they're going to start to fight us. Right? And, and that's, that, that highlights a point, which is sometimes doing too much violence or doing violence in the wrong way is just as damaging to the political cause as doing too little. And I'll come back to that later. Um, what I think is particularly kind of interesting is the response that was also on the pen drive uh, that Abu Osama gets back. And this guy basically writes back and says, uh, or that Abu Osama sends back, and he basically writes back and says, look, every time one of you senior guys gets killed, I get a new set of orders or rules for how I should do my job. So can I please get this in writing so it's a little bit consistent and standard? And you know, for those of you who've worked in organizations where leadership is changing over a lot, right, requesting standard operating procedures that seems like a very normal thing, right? Totally reasonable thing to do. Uh, in this context, though, um, there's, there's a little something here that's interesting, which is notice the solution here is we want to have a meeting in person. Right? Now, for you know, folks here at New America or for me at Princeton, when I bring my people together and we want to have a meeting, that's pretty costless. Right? For a secret army fighting a very militarily competent foe, this is a huge risk, right? We're going to bring everyone together in one place and you know, there's a reasonable chance the Americans will drop a bomb on it. So they're taking a lot of risk here to make sure that this guy uses violence in the right way. And so, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So that's the first observation. Uh, the second observation is that groups seem to write a lot of stuff down, given that they're mostly supposed to be covert armies. So this isn't unique to Al-Qaeda. I'm going to show you some examples from Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, you know, the, the Mau Mau, the Kenyan insurgency in, in, the, in the 1950s against the British in Kenya, they required people to fill out receipts in duplicate for, for the supplies that they were taking from villages surrounding the areas they were operating in. Uh, but in Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and this is another set of documents that Brian has worked with, uh, they, re they recorded a, a bunch of things. They had people sign statements. And so this is an oath statement. Uh, written by a suicide bomber on his way into Iraq. This was in a cache of documents that was picked up near the border between Iraq and Syria in a town called Sinjar uh, in 2007, Brian? 2007. Yeah, in 2007. And, you know, this guy is he's, he's agreeing to some things that are sensible, right? You might want to include, have people attest to the fact that they're there voluntarily. But, you know, we've got his picture and his thumbprint. That's kind of useful stuff for the people who are going after this guy. Um, this is an oath statement from that same cache of documents of basically what someone's attesting to before they can go abroad for medical treatment. And again, the various points here are sensible, right? I'm going to listen and obey the orders of the emir during my trip. Uh, I'm not going to come back to Iraq without orders. This gentleman has nicely given us his thumbprint and no, no picture, but it's a standardized form that was routinely used. So they're operating at a scale where they're sending enough people that it's worth printing off a bunch of these things for them to sign. So that, that might not be that weird. Um, you know, here's, here's one for someone who's leaving the group permanently. This gentleman nicely gave his picture, his thumbprint, his signature, and his cell phone number. And look, you know, there, a lot of this stuff is reasonable. Um, you know, Al-Qaeda can't be held responsible for my leaving Iraq. If I leave without permission, I forfeit my benefits. It's my decision. Like, look, I'd like my, I'd like my graduate students to agree to some of this stuff. But the thing is, 700 of these documents 
were found in one place. Right? So for a secret army to have these kinds of things, which have pictures and cell phone numbers and signatures, for 700 of their guys floating around in one place, that seems odd. And this is not unique to Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So Al-Qaeda in the 1990s did similar things. So, so this is a translated version of a standard form that you were supposed to fill out when you showed up at one of the training camps that Abu Hafs ran in Afghanistan. And we have this because uh, when he was killed during the invasion and folks went to his house, they found a box with, I think it was 75 CDs. I don't remember the exact number that had all his work correspondence going back to 1993. Right, this was the basis of some of the reports we did on so Al-Qaeda's work in Somalia in the 1990s. But you're asking people to basically fill out really sensible information if you're bringing these guys in for training. Right? You've got your Freedom of Information Act statement uh, in there. So this has been translated. The formatting's maintained. Um, and, and again, you're collecting sensible information. When did you arrive? Can you return without problems? What's your security status? All things that I would want to know. And at one, if I were managing these guys, and at one point in the 1990s, one of uh, Hoff's colleagues writes a memo to him that was in the, in the Harmony documents that says, look, we're collecting all this information on the guys who come through our camps. We know what happens to them. So let's put this in an Excel spreadsheet and figure out the profile of a good Mujahideen. So that's being a good HR manager, right? That's just kind of managing your people well. But again, in this context, you have to wonder, what's going on? Why are you putting all this stuff down on paper that could compromise your operatives and reveal what they're doing to other people? So that's kind of the motivating puzzle. And what I think is going on, and what I describe in the book, is that terrorist organizations need to, they basically need to use what we think of in the economics literature as agents, right? They need to hire people to do jobs, because you can't do it all yourself, even if you wanted to. And for various reasons, having to do with security and the kind of ability of the organization to sustain losses, you might want to create layers of hierarchy in organization. Uh, but when you do that, when you bring people in to do a job, uh, you inevitably have disputes, right? So for a few different reasons, right? One is you're operating underground, so it's inherently hard to know what to do. How will people respond to what you're doing politically? And Jay Boyer Bell wrote about this starting in the 1970s, looking at uh, Northern Ireland groups. Um, you know, this is, kind of, this is kind of Bin Laden's take on it in 2010. So this is from one of the documents that was found uh, after the Abbottabad raid. And uh, again, this is also written about in a great CTC report. Um, so Bin Laden, this is an excerpt from a letter in which he is writing about the doctrine of, uh, and Will, I apologize for the pronunciation here, uh, Tata Rus. Basically, when is it appropriate to kill Islamic civilians, Muslim civilians, in the course of advancing the jihad? And Bin Laden kind of goes on for about 14 pages on this. But the point he's making is we're losing political uh, support from people uh, because we're doing things like attacking Shia in mosques, right, or going after people who are targeting for assassination on holidays. And so we're using violence again in this kind of way that is problematic. And in this letter, he's not saying you don't understand the mission, we don't agree about what to do. He's just saying you guys are making bad choices because you don't properly understand the political impact of your actions. And so we need to do things differently. Um, sometimes, uh, so you think about this. And there are a couple ways you could kind of head this kind of thing off. So you've got these disputes, but all of those things entail security risks. So for example, you can push your people to, uh, to basically bring people in who sit within familial networks. So you bring people in that you've kind of pre-screened to want to do things the way you want to do. This is what Jamal Islamiyah did in Indonesia. The problem with that is when you recruit everyone from a small marriage network, or you require them all, in, in Jamal Islamiyah's case, to have connections to this one religious school, uh, in, in one particular town, you make it really easy for the authorities to track through the network. So that doesn't work. Uh, maybe what you want to do is you want to kind of uh, keep some records, right? So you want to you ask people to fill out paperwork so that they, A, get a signal of what do you want them to do, right? Because what I require you to report on tells me something about what you care about. But then if they report the wrong thing, you can take actions against them. Um, so, you know, this is an example of that. So uh, this is a series of letters, again, in the Harmony data between uh, Abu Hafs there on the left and uh, on the right and Abu Kabab on the left. Uh, Kabab was a, a, a jihadi who ran a set of training camps that were independent from Al-Qaeda's until some point in the very late 1990s. And there's a series of correspondence between them in the Harmony database uh, 
in which they disagree about a lot of stuff. But part of the disagreement right, is Haas is complaining about Kebab's uh, ability to follow record keeping requirements, basically to submit the expenses that he's supposed to and do it on time and in the right way. Now, imagine you have this going on. So immediately, right, this is obviously a security risk because you've got these communications. But now think about the challenge. So let's say uh, Hoffs gets that and he finds something sufficiently untoward that he wants to punish Kebab in some way. Well, then he's got this problem, kind of two problems actually. One is Kebab is in the group because he is a murderous, violent person who's really good at hurting people. And so what are you going to do to punish him? Right? You have this inherent problem. And Davey Irvine, uh, a leader in the Ulster Volunteer Force, a loyalist paramilitary in Northern Ireland, described this to me once as saying, uh, look, we had really heinous counterproductive things going on in the group, but we couldn't punish them. And the reason we couldn't punish them is that we had to worry that when people uh, got off watch, when they got done doing their job, they would come after us. And so we couldn't stop them from doing stuff. Moreover, people can go to the government. So Jamal Ahmed al Fadl, uh, known as Junior, who testifies for the US, he's like the key, he's the key prosecution uh, witness in the 1998 Africa Embassy bombing trials. He had gotten caught stealing money from Al Qaeda, went on the run, and after the bombings, basically approaches the US government and says, look, these guys are coming after me to punish me for what I did. I might have some information that's useful to you, and I hear you have this thing called the Witness Protection Program. Right? And so you, you have this problem managing discipline, managing and kind of organizing your people. So, so now you've got disputes, you have problems disciplining them, and so you get this range of organizational structures. Now, what would be useful is to have a way to think about why do we sometimes see loose hierarchy, and why do we sometimes see more? And so what I want to kind of put out is, is to suggest that there are some really clear predictors of that that let you think about what the mapping is going to be from ideology and operational environment into how you're structured. So the first is simply how much preference divergence do you have in the group? So are you recruiting everyone from a pre-screened population that's been selected to agree on how to use violence and to be kind of financially careful? So are in, you know, in one case, are you kind of Hamas, where you have this big social services infrastructure that lets you screen out people? Or are you the Mau Mau trying to figure out how to run urban operations in Nairobi in 1953, where you have to recruit a bunch of criminals to run kind of guns and steal things and finance and go after informers, who then end up doing a lot of uh, things in the name of the revolution that are really about lining their pockets and ultimately destroy your credibility. So if you're in the situation where you're recruiting people who think differently, you have incentives to ramp down and exercise control. So that's the first. Uh, the second is kind of is, is uncertainty. Basically, how hard is it for your guys in the absence, or, or girls, uh, in the absence of information and direction from leadership, how hard is it for them to figure out what should be done, what will advance our political goals? Right? If that's easy, there's no need to talk to them. You don't need to do any of this stuff. But if it's hard to know what's right, if you're like bin Laden sitting in a badabad, saying, God, you guys are you're screwing this up, then you need to reach out and communicate, and that creates links. Right? And the last thing is discrimination. And this is where ideology really comes in. And this is like, what's your theory of political change? Right? How are you thinking about violence as advancing what you're doing? And uh, terrorist groups going, you know, at least as far back as I've looked to the 1880s, they really often struggle with this. Right? They think about, OK, what's the right use of violence that will get people just riled up enough that they'll do what we want, but not so much that we turn them off. So for example, if you think about terrorists in Northern Ireland, right, the provisional IRA had this really tricky job. Right? They needed to do enough violence that they convinced the British that it was too costly to stay, but they couldn't do so much that people in London would say, my god, we can't leave, because then look at what those savages will do to our Protestant brethren. Right? So you had this really tricky calibration task. For the loyalist paramilitaries, you were trying to deter the IRA from attacking people, and you were trying to convince the British back in the rest of the, uh, the United Kingdom that you really wanted to stay. And so for that, it didn't much matter who you attacked as long as you attacked in response to kind of violations of what you thought was the right use of uh, the right way of political contestation on the, on the nationalist side. And so for those two groups, there's much more value in controlling how violence is used on the, the, the IRA side and you saw much more structure in that organization, many more efforts to exert control. So, so at this point, hopefully uh, some of you are thinking, well, 
like, uh, that's nice, but you're giving these groups way too much credit. Right, because lots of people have written about how in lots of instances participation in terrorism is kind of uh, episodic or it's driven by psychological trauma or a need to feel like you belong. And I think that's totally right. If what we want to explain is why does this person or that person get involved in this, yeah, this is totally the wrong way to think about it. But if you want to think about why are organizations producing certain outputs, and for almost all the groups that have ever done anything significant, there's a lot of organization behind it, if you want to think about that, then I'm going to argue this is really the way you should be thinking about it. And um, so I want to show you two examples of this, and then, and then we can have a discussion. So the first example, this is a, a quote from the uh, trial transcripts of the Africa Embassy bombings trial. And this is that gentleman, Jamal Ahmed Al-Fadl, who had uh, got caught stealing money from the group and went on the run. And so during the direct examination of Al-Fadl, the lawyer for the prosecution is trying to get out every source of disputes between him and the group so that nothing comes out on cross-examination that might discredit his testimony. And so he asks Fadl about this time when he and bin Laden got in an argument over, uh, over Al Fadl's salary. And this is what Al Fadl says bin Laden said back. And so to put this in kind of HR terms or econ terms, what bin Laden's saying is, look, Jamal, your outside option is terrible. So I don't need to pay you very much to meet your reservation wage. These other guys, they have good opportunities if they leave the group. So I have to pay them more to keep them in. Right? And this is exactly what a kind of rational uh, human, re human resources manager would do. Right? You pay people their reservation wage. So that's one example from Al-Qaeda. Uh, the second example is problems with graft in Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And so this is a graph I just like to show because it pins down where the set of documents that I'm going to show you uh, next was found. So this is uh, a corner in, in uh, Tuzlia, Iraq. And, and there, uh, a, a set of uh, coalition forces were going out on a raid. They had a military working dog with them. It alerted on something. They called the EOD guys in, dug it up, and they found a drum. And in the drum were some AK-47, some explosives, and some pen drives. And on the pen drives were the spreadsheets for the Al-Qaeda in Iraq administrative emir for Mosul for late 2007. And so this is a screenshot of his income tracking spreadsheet and his expense tracking spreadsheet. And each tab was a different subsidiary unit, and then he had some tabs that rolled up the expenses across units. And it was kind of nicely hyperlinked, so it was fairly quick for him to do this stuff. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like translated. And so you know, he records a unique identifier for each person, because there are lots of kind of people of various uh, names in the group. And then he records the marital status, number of children, number of women in each household. And that's nice, right? He's, he's doing this because he really cares about them. Um, no, he's, he's doing this because their pay structure was one where you got a flat fee, or at least this is what their articulated pay structure was, was you got a flat fee for participating that was a really, really bad salary for Iraq in that point in time. And then you got an increment for each child in your house and an increment for each spouse that you had for each wife. Right? And so he's tracking this because what's happening is his units are saying, look, I have five fighters who are active, five deceased fighters. They have so many women and children. And so he could calculate what he had to send them each month so they could make their salary payments to the fighters. Uh, so this is, this is August 2007. Uh, this is a spreadsheet from December 2007 found in a different setting. And it's hard to see, but there's this set of names over here where this person has made some notes. And so we can zoom in on that a little bit. And what he's basically saying, since I don't think anyone can read this, is uh, Abu Nasir had these names. Uh, he deleted them. I don't know if these guys are real. So he's got a set of payments to people that he's worried are fake. So let me jump ahead to February 2009. So on a raid to target the ISI, Islamic State of Iraq, administrative emir for northern Iraq in February 2009, a spreadsheet is picked up that has about 700 salary payments on it. And this is the last page of the spreadsheet. And that, that's in Arabic. And this is what it looks like translated. And so this, this administrative emir is recording for each unit how many people do they have, how many kids do they have, how many women do they have. And then he's got his deceased soldiers. right? So they would pay the families of deceased fighters their salary. Uh, and so he's recording those. And then he's done this calculation down at the bottom. And what he's given us here is he's given us statistical evidence of graft in his organization. Because notice, 
the number of average number of children for active fighters is about twice the average number of children for dead fighters. And so unless you think what's going on is people here who have kids and join the group are like distracted when they're setting up the ambush and so aren't as good at it, right? What's going on probably is we know they had a problem with graft. And so now if I'm the leader of a cell and I don't feel I'm paid well enough so I want Al Qaeda to give me a little more money. If I claim extra people for one of my fighters who's active, my boss can call that guy up or reach out to him and check up on me, right? If I claim it for someone who's deceased, that's much harder. Right. So what this gentleman has given us is he's given us both a demonstration of how rational they can be in managing people right, and kind of statistical evidence that he's consistently getting ripped off by his, by his, uh, his local cell leaders. So, so I want to stop there and just say, say a few words about policy implications. Uh, the first is one thing this tells you is that terrorism is inherently self-limiting in the sense that if you want to use violence in a careful, efficient way to achieve your political ends. You need this structure, you need this bureaucracy. But all of this stuff kicks off an intelligence signal that can be exploited by government. Right? So as long as kind of counterterrorism forces remain vigilant, this is a self-limiting phenomenon. Because as you grow in scale so you can do more attacks, you need more management. It's just the nature of running anything with human beings. And so you're gonna be capped in that way. So that's, the, that's kind of the first thing. The second thing is, what you need in terms of a safe haven, something that's useful for managing this, is not an ungoverned territory, right? Because that's kind of useless because people can go into that territory and extract this kind of information. What you need is a territory that's governed by someone sympathetic to you who can exclude others from it because then you can run kind of your bureaucracy in there and that's useful. Uh, and the third thing, and I think this is the most important, is in thinking about strategies to combat groups, you need to think about the end game. Right? How are you going to bring this organization, this political movement, back into normal politics? Often, and in most cases, that happens through negotiation. Right? But one criteria for negotiations to work is that you be able to have the person on the other side live up to the commitments they make at the negotiating table. And so if you're the British and you're negotiating with the IRA, you need it to be the case that when they agree to the Mitchell principles, which said, look, we're going to ultimately decommission all our weapons, they have enough cohesion as an organization to follow through on that. If you put as much pressure as you possibly can on the organization, they can't maintain that co cohesion, right? Because that pressure is going to force them to kind of give up some of this control and give up the ability to, to manage their people. And so in the Northern Ireland context, right, the British could have picked up the leaders of the provisional IRA and most of their deputies at any point in time between 1990 and 1997. They knew exactly who they were where they were and were deep, we know now, deep into the internal security bureaucracy of the organization. But they didn't, right? They put pressure on the group but gave them enough space that when it came time to come in from the cold, they could actually bring the group in. And so as we think about strategies against the Taliban or against militant groups in various places that ultimately are going to be part of the political process, we can think of kind of two options. One is calibrating the pressure against them enough so they can come in from the cold, so to speak. And the other is really clamping down, but if you do that as intensely as you can, you may leave yourself with no option other than to kind of uh, in jail everyone who believes in the cause or kill them, and that can be very costly. So uh, I'll stop there, and maybe we can talk about this a little bit. Absolutely. Okay. So what we're going to do now Bruce okay. here. Uh, is I'm going to turn it over to Will for a few minutes and then to Bruce and then we'll turn it over to Q&A with the audience. Just trying to figure out the right way to sit in the chair. Yeah, if right. If you do one of these <laughs> deals or all the way back. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating book if you haven't looked at it. Uh, I, I, uh, I mean, it's one of the more interesting books on, on terrorism that I've read over the last Ten years, aside from Bruce's, of course. Um, <laughs> but there were there were a couple things that struck me, and some of some of which that's the some of which have to do with with my own interests. Uh, but I'll I'll kind of tick through them. And can I get Jake to respond to? Sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I, I it just I'm yeah. gonna get my paper so I can take notes. Um, so one one of the things that, that Jake you you touch on a bit in your book um, you don't flesh out too much because it's mm -hmm. not your main interest but one of the things you touch on is uh, terrorist recruitment which mm -hmm. is uh, has, has been an, an interest of mine 
Um, and you make some observations in there that I, I, I'd like you to tease out a little bit if you could. Um, one of the interesting things Jake talks about is, is the need for these groups, of course, when they're doing recruitment, uh, to engage in some sort of screening process. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Jake frames it in terms of uh, 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 preference convergence and preference divergence. But mainly what he's talking about is you need to make sure that the people coming on board are as dedicated to the cause as you and see things the same way you do in terms of targeting and handling the administration and so forth. So, for example, Al-Qaeda, uh, was able to do this by setting up training camps in Afghanistan and they could watch people cycling through the camps and see who was going to be on board in terms of ideology, skills, and so forth. Um, the RAF, uh, the Red Army Faction, was able to do this by, by getting potential recruits to engage in bank robberies to see how, how committed they were going to be. One, one interesting observation that hadn't occurred to me, but, but it makes a lot of sense, is that Hamas does this with their charitable organizations because they're able to see there who's willing to make sacrifices and give, volunteer their time to engage in the work. And they're also able to, to gauge their, their ideology. Um, and there, there are some other ways to, uh, to go about doing it. Um, but it was, it, was interest, it was interesting to me to, to see this emphasis on, on finding people that were going to share um, your preferences. And what interested me about Al-Qaeda is that they seem to do a lot of that, right? Mm -hmm. For, for Al-Qaeda Central and some of the affiliate organizations, but they also make uh, repeated calls for lone wolf attacks. And this is something you talk about a lot in your book, is, as, for an organization, a terrorist organization that's keen on achieving political objectives, mm -hmm. encouraging lone wolves can be a bad idea, right? Because lone wolves are not necessarily going to share your preferences. You don't have any command and control over them. So my, my question to you is, um, how common is it that we have terrorist groups that, that, on the one hand, are very careful about selecting recruits, but on the other hand, also make these calls for lone wolves? And, and in Al-Qaeda's case, why do you think that they do that? Why, why have both strategies? Because they seem to be working at cross-purposes. So, so I, think that's, I think that's right that they work at cross-purposes sometimes. And I, it, my sense is, I think Bruce might have a better sense here, but my sense is there's, it's pretty rare that you see this. What I think has happened with Al-Qaeda is the group is um, basically so capacity constrained at this point because they're under such security pressure that this was kind of an, one of the few options for actually getting things done. And it's a real change from early on. So one of the things that first got me interested in this was in 2002, 2003, looking at actually some of the kind of Al-Qaeda training manuals that were being posted on the internet or had been posted on the internet. And a lot of them were kind of redacted versions of US Army field manuals that had lots of information on things like, if you wanted to blow up a bridge, where should you put the explosives? Right? But they didn't have things that my friends who'd been in EOD told me were in many of the training manuals they were quoting on like how to fuse them or where to put them or kind of how to make uh, homemade options. And so what was interesting is it looked a lot like the strategy that cartels use to maintain control over businesses in which you withhold key technical information from your business partners to make sure that they have to come back to you. So this was manuals, these were manuals that were kind of put online in 99, 2000, 2001. So before the group came under so much pressure. Right? And so that was in a sense not giving people the ammunition they needed to do lone wolf attacks, right? being actually a little bit restricted mm -hmm. in what you provided. So my best guess is this is something that's changed over time as the group has found that it really is uh, pretty much unsuccessful at centrally coordinating attacks. But they still, I mean, you, you, you still have them attempting external attacks, even, even out of the Pakistan region. So, it, I mean, they seem to be, it seems to be dual track. And I, I, I guess the point would be that it's a bad management strategy on their part, right? Well, and I think it's a sign of kind of desperation, uh -huh. right? If you, could, if you could handle it all yourself, that's clearly first best. But maybe you can, so you encourage this kind of activities. Can I ask more questions? Sharp pass. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the other thing, you, you make a sharp distinction um, uh, between insurgent groups and terrorist groups. And it's kind of the setup for the, for the book in, in looking at terrorist groups. But the, the main distinction you point out, of course, is that insurgent groups 
control some sort of territory so they can be a little bit more open uh, in what they do. And then you kind of segue into talking about the terrorist dilemma. The dilemma arises from the fact that they have to be secret uh, in, in, in going about what they do. Um, but one of the main groups that you focus on is Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which you know, I think a lot of people would argue is more properly seen as an insurgent group, at least in the, in the period that you study it. So I, I, I just, I, I know it's a continuum, um, but I, I want to understand uh, a little bit better from you um, how, how, why frame it as a terrorist organization um, uh, in your book, but, but also how, do any of your insights about how terrorist groups operate, do they map onto insurgent groups at all, or are these just two completely different animals? Um, so, so I think a lot of this does map onto insurgent groups very well. The key distinction is do you have that territory where you can safely manage your organization, right? or to what extent do you have that? And so Al-Qaeda in Iraq is pretty unusual as insurgencies go in the sense that because of who their enemy was, and because kind of there were so many coalition forces in Iraq for most of the war, they were under risk at any point in time and space throughout the war. Right? And this is very different than insurgencies operating in, say, rural Africa, where the state literally doesn't have the capacity to go certain places. Right? Or, for example, the FARC in Colombia, where until you know, the middle of the, the current century, there were places the Colombian government just couldn't get its forces. Um, the Taliban's kind of somewhere in between. And so when you're in that setting, where any piece of information that goes to the folks you're fighting can allow them to target you, right? then you have a really high premium on security and secrecy and a very high cost to pay for the kinds of managerial activities they engaged in. Right? Now, the fact that they still did that kind of stuff suggests that there's real value to it on their part, that it's a clear kind of preference as an organization, and that operating in other ways that might have kicked off less of an intelligence signature were just distinctly uh, less useful from the perspective of advancing the political goals. Bruce? I'm still squirreling, actually. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay, I guess I have to speak. Um, <laughs> well, I like the book, too. In fact, uh, when Brian first invited me to be a discussant to, only a couple of weeks ago, I told him, well, I'm happy to do it, because you know, all academics are happy to talk and sort of pontificate. <laughs> but I said I wouldn't have the opportunity, given various other things, to actually read the book. But then Jake was actually speaking at Georgetown at the, at the Security Studies Center a couple of weeks ago, last week, I guess. And I couldn't make, make his presentation. And from our discussion, I thought, gosh, this book is fascinating. I've got to go and read it. And that's basically what I spent uh, the weekend doing. And like Will, I think like many people, um, you know, I liked it a lot. I think it's a, it's a very important book. Um, it's important first and foremost because it looks at the timelessness of terrorism. Mm -hmm. I think too often most of the work that's been coming out recently uh, believes that uh, the era of terrorism began on September 11th, 2001, and not two millennia ago, uh, with the Sakari, for, ex for example. Uh, a lot of the work today is very afraid to draw any historical parallels or even lessons in terms of countermeasures, so either lessons learned or unlearned, with historical terrorist groups. And I think this is really a tremendous, um, a tremendous strength of, of, of uh, Jake's, Jake's work. Um, let me make just a few comments generally about the work itself uh, and some of his materials, and then of just a very few comments to jump off on discussion on the work itself. Reading the book, I think one thing that leapt out at me and something that I've always been interested in, and I think Jake and his, his, his research and analysis goes a far way to discussing, but I think it could still be taken a step further is you know, how large can a group become before it becomes inefficient? And I think this is an enormously important question. Historically, most terrorist groups weren't large. Uh, the Red Army faction uh, never had more than perhaps three dozen actual trigger pullers and bomb throwers that had a larger support network. But it was not a large group. Um, in Palestine, uh, the Stern Gang, for example, only had maybe a couple of hundred people. IRA, I think, is another excellent case mm -hmm. because the leaders of the IRA, or the, when I'm saying IRA, I mean the Provisional Irish Republican Army, the modern day variant, uh, not the older one, they could have certainly had you know, thousands of fighters potentially, and they might have even had the weaponry to arm them given uh, some of the caches that were uncovered. But it's interesting that uh, the IRA, in terms of its actual soldiers, never went more than four or 500 persons. And I think this was a conscious decision on the part of the leadership that they couldn't control them. And discipline, of course, as Jake points out, and I'll come back to, is enormously uh, important. 
So one has to ask, what's the tipping point? Um, when does it become too difficult to exercise any kind of meaningful command and control and communication? And when you have, let's say, a hybrid phenomena that's both lone wolves, uh, bunches of guys, as it's been called, and more directed, uh, deployed, um, uh, people capable of receiving and carrying out orders type of, 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 of cadre. In my view, I think that's what we've been seeing with Al-Qaeda. And that's one of the things that makes Al-Qaeda unique. I mean, the other thing that makes Al-Qaeda unique, and which Jake does bring out, I think, very clearly, even in just the case study of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, is just how large Al-Qaeda was compared to many previous terrorist organizations, mm -hmm. and the kinds of challenges that introduced. And to me, this is a story that's still being written. Um, and we will see, because Al-Qaeda, I think, has had to adapt and adjust, of course, to many of our countermeasures, uh, to its own operational style, to avoid serially replicating many of the mistakes that have eroded um, the core. Secondly, and what I thought was uh, fascinating about Jake's work and was part of the focus of an article I wrote this summer in Studies in Conflict and Terrorism is the pedigree of his sources, um, which are extremely important. And these are many of the released documents in Harmony and other, other categories by the US government. But we have to be careful, and I'm not accusing you of it all over-exaggerating or misrepresenting them. But the documents that scholars and analysts have hitherto had access to is infinitesimal compared to what's out there. I mean, it's infinitesimal to the point that it's not ludicrous, because I think these documents, as Jake proves, provide an enormously important window and insight onto the terrorist organizations. But this is, at best, a second draft of history. If journalism is the first draft, this is the second draft, because until those documents are declassified and released in greater volume. We really only have a snapshot. They're only the tip of the iceberg. And you know, the ludicrousness of this, this was the 17 documents that were released on the first anniversary of bin Laden's killing. That that, in any way, can be regarded as representative of Al Qaeda, I think, is just laughable, given that there are literally thousands. And that's probably a conservative estimate of how many documents there are. And having worked extensively in archives for 30 years on terrorist and counter-terrorist groups, you never get the complete picture anyway. But if you want to get the complete picture, you've got to amass as many of those sources as uh, possible. And that, I think, is both one of the triumphs and strengths of, of Jake's book, but also, I think, a cautionary note for others. Because firstly, he's raised everyone's game. He's raised the stakes to actually do serious research on terrorist groups in the future. It's going to have to be almost an all-source form of research that's going to use declassified well, or documents seized from the terrorist groups that eventually get declassified by the government, court transcripts, which we showed, saw Jake uh, evidencing, memoirs. That's actually one of the triumphs of uh, Jake's book. I've never seen any work or any study on terrorism that actually sat down and systematically took a look. I think it's 108 memoirs from around the world. I mean, there's a treasure trove of information that's enormously um, uh, important, as well as various other accounts that you're going to have to come at terrorism from all these perspectives. And the question one has to ask, I mean, I don't think any of us can answer it, but I'll give you four hypotheses. Um, you know, why aren't these materials being made more available. I mean, it's not a sources and methods issue. We know many of the documents were seized by our ground forces, in some cases, uh, more than a decade ago in Afghanistan and nearly a decade ago in Iraq. So the source we know, the method that they were obtained is no secret. Uh, these were the documents that were left behind by Al Qaeda, by the Taliban, or by um, AQI. But yet we find that these documents, there's absolutely no interest and no priority in their release. And this is really a shame, not just, I think, for the damage that it does to scholarship, but also to our understanding of our adversary uh, today. And also, I think these would be tremendously useful tools in public diplomacy, that we would have the rope to hang these groups with by actually having their own materials uh, to hold them to account to. And that would reveal their cynicism, their manipulation of religion and theology, um, their, um, their cynicism in attacking their, their own co-religionists and so on. But it seems there's you know, four reasons that have stood in the way of this. And I'm happy to say that Kerry Lamack is standing in the back, the bipartisan policy organization. I was one of the minor authors. Peter Bergen of the New America Foundation was the lead author. Our report that was released last month, one of our recommendations was that to, to hasten this process. But I think the reasons why they're not being released is control, uh, that old adage in intelligence that knowledge is power and that knowledge is bureaucracy prevents their release as, as various agencies squabble over one another and believe that holding them and clutching them tighter uh, makes them more important. Uh, 
obviously the whole vetting process, especially when our government is, has been shut down, when there's not the money, there certainly isn't the time, there's fewer personnel, and there's a low priority, you can see why there's not a lot of attention attached to it. Those are kind of understandable. What I find less understandable, and I think also motivates this, is sort of an ahistorical view to terrorism, which Jake's book commendably pushes uh, back against. When I've raised this uh, issue in the intelligence community, I've been told many times that they're irrelevant to, to, to today's threats, that they don't mean anything. And this obviously is something Jake's book very much demonstrates the power of this information even years. And then I think there's a political reason. I mean, if you go around saying that Al-Qaeda has been strategically defeated, um, if you uh, believe in things that, you know, as I heard a very senior official once say that, in two, that the main terrorism problem we face is that it's the same that happened in England in 2005 when four guys just decided on their own to get on a train in Leeds and come down to London. Well, right there is an example of not understanding history because if there was ever any centrally core Al-Qaeda directed terrorist attack in the last decade, it was the, the, the London attack. And then, of course, you know, I think a lot of these documents raise lots of questions about our relations with very sensitive allies. Um, and, um, you know, the rush in those 17 documents to exonerate Pakistan uh, of harboring bin Laden, perhaps that's true. I mean, it may well be. I have no idea. But the point is, I think I'm going to remain agnostic until I see something more than a thimble full of, uh, of, of, of uh, documents. And I think the problem is that because of the 21st century because of the information age. The divergence now between classified material and open source material is greater than it's ever been just because of this volume of material that's sitting there that no one really has, um, has, has access to. Uh, very briefly, just to wrap up and to focus a little bit more on the book. Uh, as I said, I think one of the real strengths of Jake's work is that he demonstrates uh, the timelessness of terrorist organizations. And as I always tell my students, not everything was invented on September 10, 2001 and implemented the following day. Um, a lot of what Jake talked about immediately reminded me of a classic book that's, that's almost completely unknown, Peter Hart's uh, seminal, The IRA and Its Enemies, where he similarly had access to, and also the IRA, this is the original IRA, not the current one, the one from the 19-teens and the 1920s kept you know, much like AQI, meticulous documents of the demographic patterns, the jobs, the ages of its inheritance. It's fascinating because it cuts against all of the sort of the uh, conventional wisdom or prejudices. Actually, the people who joined the IRA in County Cork, at least, were better educated and wealthier than most of the other fighters, where our, our image is often of, you know, itinerant farmhands or people from the, the underclass. Uh, the average age of the recruits was 24. Uh, Interestingly, that happens to be the average age of the 19 9-11 uh, hijackers. Uh, the average age of Palestinian uh, suicide bombers has been 21. The average age of Hezbollah fighters, 23. So we see that there's enormous uh, continuity. Then if you recall, just a few years ago, a lot was made about entire soccer teams, in, both in Hebron and in Saudi Arabia, becoming suicide bombers. What Peter Hart found is very common for entire soccer teams or uh, hurling teams in Ireland to join uh, these groups. Uh, secondly, I think Jake points out very rightly how terrorists themselves live in a, in a, in a fantasy world, that they believe in their own uh, propaganda, and that is, is part of the reason why the leaders try to exert uh, so much control over organizations. And I think the one thing that the book really brings out clearly, which bears constant to repeating, is that terrorist groups aren't monolithic. And a lot of the discussion in Washington and a lot of the reportage seems to pick our enemy, portray our enemies or depict our enemies as somehow much more politically uh, homogeneous than we are, that somehow there's not leadership rival or personality rivalries, uh, there's not uh, disputes over tactics um, or over policies. And what Jake's book brings out very clearly is that there are very powerful centrifugal forces operating within undergrounds. And I would argue that. One of the reasons that the minutia of bureaucracy and budgets is so important, it's because the way, this is the way that the leadership can say, we're the boss. It's a form of domination and control when they don't have much domination or, or control over far-flung um, far uh, operatives. I think the book is also especially interest, interesting when it talks about the challenges terrorist groups face in calibrating violence. And I think this is something that we all knew but he really brings it out so sharply and provides so many different empirical justifications. I mean, in essence, 
terrorist leaders have to choreograph their violence for, in essence, almost at least three, and perhaps there's more than I haven't thought of, different or audiences. Firstly, their enemy, the governments who they're attacking, who they want to terrorize sufficiently and put enough pressure on, but not trigger or provoke the kind of backlash that will completely stomp on them. In other words, terrorist groups want to use just enough violence, but not enough that, that, that it provokes some massive counter response. And again, terrorist groups live in a fantasy world and believe their own propaganda. You can see how they often get these types of things, um, types, types of things wrong. They also want to use a level of violence that's tolerable to their constituents. This was one of the most famous phrases from uh, the IRA troubles when Willie Whitelaw, who was the Home Secretary in the early 1970s, said the goal on the government's part was to drive the violence down to a tolerable uh, level. And I think that still remains the policies of governments um, the world over. I think no one's under the illusion that we'll completely eliminate uh, terrorists. But also, the terrorists, on the other hand, have to think whether their viol violence will be tolerated by their constituents. And I think that's very much at the heart of the dispute over killing of Shia, and especially AQI mm -hmm. and Abu Musa al Zarqawi. And then, of course, as, as Jake uh, very ably points out, is members of the organization because there are always going to be the young hotheads. I and mean, people don't join terrorist organizations to sit on their hands. They join them because they're action-oriented. And one of the main challenges of the leadership is to sort of deploy those people when they're going to be most useful for a strategic purpose, but also to hold them back when it doesn't serve um, the, uh, the strategic purposes of the organization. Finally, I would say where, though, I mean, I'm not sure I'm necessarily in disagreement, but perhaps we can discuss this more. But, but I also found this in the book is the policy uh, implications, because here I think there's lot. I think what, what Jake is arguing is quite sound, but I think it raises lots of, uh, lots of questions. I mean, I agree terrorism is inherently, to an extent, self-limiting. But I think the other dimension that we have to study of terrorist groups is innovation and creativity. I mean, most terrorist groups are not terribly, you know, Brian Jenkins very famously 40 years ago said terrorists are more imitative than innovative. And basically, he's still right, but that's the problem. What happens when you come across, uh, in my own, you know, scientific uh, uh, jargon, the so-called evil geniuses, you know, the people who are few and far between, uh, Ramzi Ahmed Youssef, who didn't just want to kill a handful of people, but wanted to topple one tower onto another and kill 60,000 people in 1993, or his uncle, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who cooked up the 9-11 attacks, or even Ibrahim al-Asiri with his various sorts of bombs uh, secreted in people's bodies. So it may be that most terrorists are imitative and not innovative, but you know, when those, come when those who, the evil geniuses come around, the, they scare the bejesus out of, uh, out of us. And in that sense, it may not be terribly self-limiting. Also, how do we account for the longevity of terrorist groups if they're self-limiting? Uh, David Rappaport very famously uh, 20, over 20 years ago said, 90% of most terrorist groups don't last a year. Uh, this has been some of, some of the work that Audrey Kurth Cronin has done. Mm -hmm. True, but you know, I don't care about that 90% that don't last more than a year. I mean, they're you know, floatsome and jetsome. It's the 10% that lasts not only more than one year, but go on to last more than two decades that we have to worry about. And I think that would be interesting as applying a lot of your analysis to very long-standing groups, how they've adapted and adjusted and managed these, these processes. And perhaps, I mean, superficially, one can say manage them better than the groups that don't last um, as long. Um, I think ungoverned territory is still important. I mean, I agree that it's, more, it's better to have a state sponsor or at least someone who's, who's highly uh, permissive. But I think border areas are increasingly, uh, especially in the Middle East and North Africa, more and more uh, important. You know, is the end game to bring terrorists into negotiation? With the IRA, yes. They were the kind of stereotypical terrorist groups that wanted a seat at the table. And Martin McGuinness is, of course, the first minister in Stormont now. Uh, but what about those other terrorist organizations, like Al-Qaeda, let's say, that have more apocalyptic uh, views? Um, can we negotiate with them? Or really, do we have to? you know, realize that probably that kind of threat, and I'm, I'm positing this, I don't know, but you know, maybe that's like an LTTE type of threat, and that the only way the Sri Lankan government to el could eliminate the LTTE was to absolutely eviscerate them. I mean, in, in, in true word, and that was, who knows how permanent it will be, and also, it's a I'm not advocating either in this evisceration that you have the scorched earth policies that, that we saw that involved lots of civilians, but it may be that there, is a, that there is a category of terrorist groups you can't negotiate with, and therefore, how do you approach them? So let me stop there. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Q&A. Um, 
directly, and then I'm just going to harass Jake intermittently. Um, please raise your hand, uh, wait for the microphone, and uh, introduce yourself and the organization that you're coming from before you ask a question. So any, any questions out there? Yes, sir. Aaron, Aaron Manis, University of Maryland. Uh, so I haven't seen this book yet, but I've read some of your other work, great stuff. We cited it in a study we did, Big Data Analysis on Lashkar e Taiba, where we found that uh, the traditional sort of counterinsurgency stuff didn't work, that it was not effective. They had bottomless, they could recruit from a bottomless well of disaffected youth. So we got interested in the question of sort of getting inside their decision making in their organization and messing it up. And I'm curious, we didn't get to that, but you talked about policy implications, and I guess the policy implications we've talked about so far are strategic, but maybe you could talk about tactics. What kinds of opportunities are there from this kind of study and this kind of data? Well, so I think, I think that's a great question, um, and I, I, um, I really uh, look forward to reading that. I've, I've seen some work on Lashkari Taiba where people have uh, basically built data from the martyr biographies that they, that they produce. Um, I think what, what's clear from this is in, in many groups, although not all, there are internal managerial structures that can be exploited. So for example, in groups where managing finances is closely tracked, right, that suggests opportunities both in terms of uh, altering documents so that people kind of lose their ability to maintain a clear picture on the finances, and you thereby create opportunities for the perception of graft and thievery between different levels of the organization. Uh, it also suggests things like if you're thinking about, for example, seizing funds, right, it could be very useful to have ways to do that where for some period of time after the seizure happens or the freezing happens, it is in fact not publicized. And so you create a situation where the person responsible for those funds within the organization has to account for why suddenly there is no money available that, where it should be available. If you immediately go out with press releases on what you've done, then that person has an immediate excuse. Right? And look, there are kind of civil liberties implications there and all kinds of other, other things, but the, the key point is you have these clear uh, control problems within many groups, and you don't need to exacerbate those problems to create tension within the group. You just need to exacerbate the perception of those problems. And there are lots of kind of sneaky ways you could think about doing that. One of, one of my old colleagues up at West Point, James Forrest, and sort of tongue-in-cheek one time suggested that when we find one of these actors within a terrorist organization like Al-Qaeda, we ought to send them expensive presents to generate mistrust, right? Which is obviously tongue-in-cheek, but gets at this idea. Uh, other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ahmad Bitar. Uh, uh, one blue. Actually, I want to ask about um, uh, the ideology or the cause behind the Islamic uh, group in particular. Uh, I'm from Syria. I just arrived. Uh, we have also two groups, like Islamic states in, in uh, Iraq and uh, Syria, ISIS and al-Nusra. Both claim that they are working for al-Qaeda and they are affected uh, by al-Qaeda thoughts and ideology, but they are fighting now each other. And we are happy because they are fighting. But actually, about uh, the kind of uh, ideology or the cause, you, s you mentioned something about that uh, over-violence. Mm -hmm. uh, I must say that uh, organizations like Al-Qaeda or ISIS have this own, own uh, ideology belief that violence is necessary to establish fear or establish justice. Uh, let's say that bombing a car or bombing a place, uh, I tried to ask once, why did they do that? And what about the innocents? Uh, the, there is imams or shiuchs put fatwas regarding these topics, like when they bombing a car with civilians uh, inside the area. The fatwa is like this. If they are good people, we are sending them directly to heaven. And if I, they are bad people, we are, we are making the world get, rev get rid of them. So we are doing them a favor mm -hmm. for the good people and doing the others a favor for the bad people. So I want just to make sure that about the ideology, because 
uh, the the uh, organization like uh, uh, Ir Irish uh, Republic, it's different than uh, Al Qaeda because they have a cause that can recruit few people. But for for Al Qaeda, they their cause is like uh, they they claim they are representing Islam. Right, right. So what's about the ideology in this organization? Did you, uh, how it's what's the percentage uh, in recruiting when they recruiting people? Okay, in this. Thank you. Jake first. Yeah, so, so I think when I, when I use ideology, what I have in mind in this setting and thinking about how groups are going to behave is, is, um, is actually more of like a theory of political change. So it's what's your theory about how the use of violence is going to lead to change. And so uh, I don't know enough to know what that is for uh, ISIS or, or al-Nusra now. For al-Qaeda in Iraq, at least from the stuff that kind of I've seen, it looks like the theory of change was basically we're going to supplant the existing local power structures in part of the country with ones that we're going to create. And we're going to do that by basically intimidating people into not trying to exercise power. And then we're going to expand the area that we control over time. Um, that is a uh, kind of theory of change that requires that you use violence in ways that compel people to not engage in the political process, but not use it so much that they decide to take up arms against you or start cooperating with, uh, with in that case, coalition forces in the country. And as the group uh, overstepped that, and as it became clear that they overstepped that, um, there are indications, and as Bruce said, we don't know how representative this is, but there are indications of trying to walk that back and to try and kind of calibrate the level of violence that would be appropriate. So my, my suspicion is that lots of this, the, the kind of ideological statements that you referred to, that is in part a way of getting your fighters to be willing to do stuff, but that the leadership has a more, probably has a more sophisticated political vision in terms of how they're thinking about uh, violence advancing their cause of having uh, an Islamist state in part or all of Syria that they control. And the fighting between the two groups, I would suspect, is fairly standard political competition when you have two groups that want to control a piece of territory and they can't reach a bargain over it for whatever reason, they end up fighting. Other thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I have two. And this kind of brings me to some of the central points in your book. I, I kept coming back to, to ISIS uh, when I was reading your book um, because a, a lot of your argument for why these groups want to tighten things up and thus they make themselves vulnerable because they tighten up, mm -hmm. is because they want to control the political impact of their violence. But I kept thinking of ISIS, and ISIS seems to be, in many ways, running in the opposite direction. Or if you want to put it differently, going back to AQI's bad behavior mm -hmm. in 2006, and they don't seem to have learned the lessons. And so does it necessarily follow, given that they're not thinking carefully about political impact, that they wouldn't want to tighten things up and thus make themselves vulnerable. I don't know if that's quite right, because as, as you've demonstrated, and I think we would find if we found secret troves of documents again, they would still be doing the, the bookkeeping. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily the case that you have to want to calibrate in order to put these bureaucratic structures in place. I mean, there might be other reasons to do it. I think ISIS is a good case for that. Will, can I push you and just throw out another a comment to the group, which is perhaps this is evidence of that scale point, right, that we are talking about earlier, where ISIS has grown to the point where it can't control the organization anymore. I mean, I would argue, and I think Jake would agree, when you look at AQI, the central organization did try to control and limit violence in various ways, and it had lost control and couldn't communicate. I mean, that seems less likely in the case of ISIS because it does have more of a safe haven and communicate more, sa more securely. But is it possible that that's what we're seeing there, is that we've grown to the point and now they can't control themselves? That's, I, I, that's, I leave it to Jake to answer. The, the, <laughs> other, thing, the other thing I wanted to, to raise was you mentioned uh, several times in the book, particularly towards the end, that, that decentralization of these groups um, under when they're under pressure of counter-terrorist forces that we should take this as a metric of success. Um, but again, looking at the Syria example, where you see this fracturing of, of Al-Qaeda, uh, Zawahiri basically unable to control ISIS. ISIS very publicly giving the bird to Zawahiri, not playing nice with, with this other group, Nusra, which, which uh, pledged allegiance directly to Zawahiri. 
it's hard to look at that and, and view it as a counterterrorism success. It looks like it's metastasizing. ISIS seems to be setting itself up as a competitor in many ways to Al-Qaeda. I mean, we may be watching the birth of a new global jihadist group that's, that's in competition with Zawahiri. So am I thinking about it incorrectly in, in terms of the, the framework in your book? No, no, it, it, I think you're thinking about it right, but it's, it's kind of, it, they're two different things here, right? There's the, what do you see when you have an organization that's coming under pressure and voluntarily giving up control? versus what do you see when you have an organization that uh, develops deep internal political disagreements and so falls apart and separates into competing factions. And what, I, what you've described in Syria and what I think is going on is more of the latter. Right? So it's not that Al-Qaeda is saying, oh man, the Syrian government is getting really good at figuring out who's who and, and tracking through our lines of communication to particular cells, so we better let them, let them go their own way. And as a result, you get the split. It's much more that they're kind of presumably competing uh, leadership groups on each side. And I s strongly suspect that each leadership group, if they could, would like to have a really tight control over their part of the organization. Mm -hmm. right. So in, in that sense, um, uh, I, I think there's, you want to think about those as slightly separate things. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know, the other thing to, to keep in mind in thinking about this is when you see changes in groups, right, oftentimes groups will, and this goes to Bruce's point about technology, oftentimes groups will think, take a period of time and think very hard about how to organize and then shift. And there can be kind of discontinuous improvements in how they operate. Um, but within each kind of era in which they're set up in a particular way, the changes I think are very informative about how well uh, the government is doing. Mm -hmm. Bruce, any thoughts? What should we think if we, if we are at a point where we've got Nusra on one side with a closer affiliation to Al-Qaeda and ISIS sort of growing out of an, of a, of an Al-Qaeda affiliate and the, so the sort of follow-on to the Islamic State of Iraq, which in turn was the follow-on to Al-Qaeda in Iraq, um, and having that direct lineage, what should we expect from competition between these groups? How are they going to compete? Is that a recipe for more violence? Is it a recipe for... Uh, more civil service provision. What's is, you know? What can we look at from the historical record about what we might expect there? I mean, so so if I I think in a few historical examples where you have multiple group, groups competing on the same side of an issue, um, you have seen both patterns. So you've seen both competition over kind of how much violence can you produce, and you've seen points in time where one group makes a decision to back down. So in the competition between uh, Fatah and Hamas in the occupied territories in 2002-2003, most people think that there was a dynamic there where there was competition over who could do more. Mm -hmm. And that was how the political competition was expressed. Uh, going back to the 1905-06 uh, revolutions in Russia, you had a period in time where uh, the Social Democrats, uh, Lenin's group, and the Party of the Socialist Revolutionaries, the kind of other more um, extreme left-wing terrorist group, competed over how much terrorist violence they could do, how many people, the Russian leaders, they could assassinate. Uh, but around mid-1906, on the side of the Social Democrats, they reached a decision that politically that was becoming counterproductive. Mm -hmm. And so they switched, and they stopped trying to compete on violence and actually tried to get all their local units to back down. What happened at that point is something that maybe uh, is happening in Syria, is some of those units, when they got the order to kind of stand down and stop doing so much, said, no, no, we like this. We think we're attacking enemies that we should be attacking. And so now we're going to join the socialist revolutionaries. Um, and so you can have these, these things change over time. I don't think there's a common pattern. Got it. Other questions from the audience? Yeah, let's start there and then here. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, Mike Rollins with Booz Allen, retired FBI. So taking into account all of your research and, and what you wrote, and I guess this is for the, the three of you, if you had five minutes with the current national security team and the counterterrorism practitioners and policymakers, what one or two takeaways would you want each of them to have as they start to formulate policy going forward, particularly as we're looking at at times we're probably going to see diminished resources and diminished budgets? That's a, that's a great question. I think the um, uh, I think there are two things that I would want to emphasize. Um, one is that 
the, uh, to the extent that it can be, the strategy of uh, leadership targeting uh, should be continued because by all kind of, uh, by most evidence that you see, it is putting a serious dint on the ability of groups to coordinate and manage activities and gain the economies of scale that they would like to from having operatives in multiple places around the world. So I think that's the first. I think the second would be to engage in much more aggressive public diplomacy about the costs of these organizations' activities for civilians in the places they're operating. So one of the things I've found in, uh, in a series of public opinion research I've been doing in Pakistan for the last uh, four or five years is that people generally really dislike militant groups, but they really, really dislike them if you tell them about the costs those groups have imposed on their society and then ask them how they feel. And that's a really light treatment, right? All it is is someone comes in your house, tells you, you know, they've done this bad stuff. How do you feel about them? That's not even having a flashy news program or something. And if that is having big effects on how people feel about them, then you kind of think what we could achieve if we more aggressively worked to get kind of all the badness these folks impose on their society is more publicized. So those would be the two, two messages. I guess one of the things I would look at, because my head is filled with serious stuff these days, is, is looking a little bit more closely at, at uh, some of the new funding patterns that we're seeing. I, I, I don't think we've quite entered a new era of, of terrorist financing, but we're inching close um, because of social media. Um, yeah. Just watching the situation in Syria, it is really surprising um, to see groups, you know, public, making very public appeals uh, for, for funding for, you know, certain uh, kinds of kits and weapons and so on and so forth, very specific dollar amounts. And then on the flip side, to see private citizens in the Gulf very publicly raising money to meet these requirements uh, that are being generated in, in Syria. And they're raising millions and millions of dollars. I mean, someone in the Intel community uh, told the Washington Post that it was hundreds of millions have, have been raised through these private charities in the Gulf for Syria. And it's being brought over the border in Turkey primarily on you know, brown bags or suitcases. And what got me to thinking about this a lot recently was, was Jake's book, just looking at the ways that money has traditionally moved from funders to organizations and out in the field. And if you cut out the middleman, um, if, if you enable money to be passed to these groups more easily, if they get more sophisticated about using online kinds of currencies rather than just moving money around over the border where you can track some couriers, you know, are we going to see new kinds of terrorism uh, created um, that is not as calibrated precisely because you have cut out this middleman that might, or the organizations that might exercise some sort of control. And a lot of this money is being sent to Syria to fuel the sectarian war. Um, I, I don't think, as I said, I, I don't think we're quite there yet in, in terms of a, a major innovation in financing, but I think we're, we're inching closer based on what I've seen in Syria. So that's what I would flag up. Well, that used to be a kind of a hard question. Um, I don't think it's so hard anymore, but you can see why no one's going to ask me to answer it. Uh, stop saying the war on terrorism is over, because it's not. And I think that has, uh, even as is, is much as we may want to focus on domestic issues, the much, as much as we've spent uh, the past uh, decade, I mean, it's not a struggle that's over. Um, I'd say, you know, stop talking about resiliency as a substitution for the war on terrorism, because I don't think we're as resilient. Um, you know, tragically, three people lost their lives in Boston. Uh, it's not the same as 3,000 people being killed in 9-11. People have drawn all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of comparisons. I don't think we're that different either because, of course, we closed down the entirety of Boston, including Logan Airport. So uh, the third thing, which will be equally poorly received, is don't artificially uh, differentiate between core Al-Qaeda and the affiliates and the associates. There are differences, but there's also similarities, but it's not an either or. I think Al-Qaeda's strength and the reason for its resiliency and longevity is because it's an idea as well as an entity, and we have to view it um, as such. Um, in turn, we have to focus on both individuals and organizations. I would argue that for most of the past uh, decade plus, we focused more on individuals. Uh, you know, the X list that President Bush had, the deck of cards, and. Uh, 
Iraq now the high value targeting. We have to focus, and I think this is one of the arguments of, J of Jake's book, is that you focus on individuals, but you also have to focus on the organizations as well. I agree completely about the middleman issue. In fact, uh, Kim Cragen and I in a 2002 report argued exactly that, but like many reports, it's you know, moldering uh, somewhere. And then finally, I mean, I would agree with uh, Will and Jake about you know, the public diplomacy, or in my view, you know, fighting as much against Al-Qaeda-ism as Al-Qaeda, the ideology that I think unfortunately still resonates in certain corners of the world that unfortunately after the Arab Spring probably has more traction than it had in 2009 or 2010. And that also means accepting that the war on terrorism is, isn't over and that this most, I'd say, low priority or under-prioritized um, arm has to become amongst, uh, you know, amongst the most important now. Okay. Here. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Tom Sanderson from CSIS. Great uh, comments today, Jacob. I'm wondering, as you look across the countries that are undergoing the dramatic political change in the Middle East and North Africa, when you think about Bruce's comment about Im imitative versus innovative, what do you see as the most innovative uh, organizational elements or activity by the groups represented there today? Oh, that's a Great question, and I'm, I'm actually going to defer on that because I, um, since, the, since the Arab Spring, I haven't closely followed individual groups in the countries uh, in that region because a lot of the work I've been doing in that period has been uh, finishing, finishing this off, which would kind of predated that. Um, but I know a couple of my co-panelists have done so very carefully, so I'll defer that one. I, I think one of the more interesting developments um, in terms of the jihadi movement are, is, is the emergence of all of these Ansar groups uh, in, in North Africa uh, and the Middle East. Um, if you were to look back at Islamist militancy uh, in the late 80s and then in the 1990s, um, you would see a pretty heterogeneous group in terms of ideologies, uh, where they wanted to target, near enemy, far enemy. You didn't really have a, a global jihadi scene much except for Al-Qaeda. Um, that was the great victory of Al-Qaeda over the past decade is putting this notion of a global jihad uh, to the fore. Um, and uh, Al-Qaeda central persists, albeit in a weakened state. Some of the affiliates are quite strong, others are weak. But you've also had the emergence of these Ansar groups, and they are flying Al-Qaeda's black banner. This is Al-Qaeda's particular design of the black banner that emerged in Iraq with AQI in 2006. It's their representation of the Prophet's flag, but it's, their, it's the Al-Qaeda flag, um, and these groups are flying it. But they have no organizational ties, strong in terms of command and control ties with Al-Qaeda Central. Um, yet they're willing to share operatives with the Al-Qaeda groups, they're willing to share uh, 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 funding and, and resources. Um, they speak the language of the global jihad. They all share the same name, but no real strong command and control links between them. To me, this is one of the most uh, interesting uh, and frustrating uh, uh, phenomena to emerge since the Arab Spring because it's, it's very difficult, I think, for, for policymakers to think about these groups. Um, because on the one hand, they, 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 they look like Al-Qaeda, they sound like Al-Qaeda, but they're not strongly linked with Al-Qaeda. To what extent does the authorization of the use of military force extend to going after those groups? And do you want to? Um, or do you risk kind of pushing them into really acting on their global jihadist rhetoric, whereas now they're quite focused uh, more locally? Well, I've got three categories for that prize. Uh, best overall would have to be Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, just because it was uh, founded in January 2009, and by the end of the year it had staged two highly successful and immensely challenging terrorist attacks, the attempted assassination of uh, the Saudi interior, well, the Saudi um, Deputy Interior Minister uh, responsible for counterterrorism, and then, of course, the Christmas Day plot. Um, then I would divide best into tactics and strategies. Uh, tactically, I would still say AQAP is probably the most innovative, and that's largely down to the evil genius, uh, Ibrahim al -Asir, Asiri. I would say, though, for the strategic award, um, it would have to go to Jabhat al-Nusra. Um, again, another group in a remarkably short s 
span of time that has been, become consequential, if not threatening. It used to take terrorist groups years, if not decades, or in Al-Qaeda's case, a decade before it could actually become consequential and threatening. Uh, they've gone from soup to nuts fairly quickly, not as quickly as AQAP did. But I think um, what's so worrisome about Jabhat al-Nusra and the influence they also have over ISIS is that they seem to be uh, you know, this type of learning organization we've always talked about. They're not making the same stupid mistakes that AQI, or they're trying to avoid making the same stupid mistakes that AQI made in Iraq, at least, uh, even if they are doing it, at least they have a good public relations um, machine, you know, with the, the free ice cream, for example, and the tug of wars, and undercutting the price of bread, for instance, you know, making bread affordable in the territory they control. To me, that's the most worrisome development in terrorism. You know, as Peter Bergen has often said, Al Qaeda has sown you know the seeds of its own defeat because it killed more Muslims than it did uh, Zionists and Crusaders. But you know, that was the old stupid Al Qaeda that we could constantly really count upon to make some egregious mistakes. I worry in Syria that these groups have lear learned uh, much better. Um, Jabhat al Nusra also controls its uh, public relations or its information operations much better than groups have had in the past. And that we may see Al-Qaeda, you know, uh, affiliates and associates that are out Al-Qaeding, al, -Qaeda, al I guess that could be a new verb, the original Al-Qaeda in being, you know, just as, just as bloodthirsty and lethal, but also are demonstrating this other side that, that, that creates much more of a political movement that, that had ever existed in the past. I would argue that Jabhat al-Nusra learned a lot of that f watching AQAP and just has done it on a broader scale. But I, I, I actually I agree with Bruce, I think, though I would frame it a little bit differently, that in Syria we've seen almost a semi-legitimization of al-Qaeda in much of the world, right? And even here in, in the States among opposition groups and folks talking about Syria and um, there was pushback when we designated Jabhat al-Nusra as, as an Al-Qaeda affiliate. Um, and in the Gulf, people are openly fundraising for groups affiliated with Al-Qaeda. Um, and we haven't seen that dynamic in a decade. Um, and, and probably never on the scale that we see it today. And so I think that context is, uh, is what I would point to. Let's take, there are two questions in the back. Let's, let's take those quickly because we're already over time. Um, everyone, most of you are still sitting here, which is a good thing, but uh, I do have to get these guys out of here, so. Hi, Jess Sadik. I'm an independent uh, Middle East consultant, but I previously was a terrorism analyst at State and at the FBI. Um, my question is about this point about groups not being monolithic, and I started thinking when Bruce mentioned that, I started thinking about um, Hamas and how amazingly um, together it's remained. Even as I can't really recall of any instance of you know, there's always rumors about the political and the, and the military branches feuding and the externals and the internals, but look how unified they are. Um, even in this given, even in this current moment when Hamas is under uh, uh, pressure from Egypt and it's on the relationships with Iran is on the ice, um, it's still, you know, where, is, where are their voices coming out saying uh, there's a problem internally? So any thoughts about how Hamas has managed to stay uh, so unified in its approach? Let's take the, the last question in the back row there as well. Uh, Michael Ryan from the Jamestown Foundation. Um, I really, really love this uh, conversation since uh, all, all of the people on the on the on the dais are my heroes. So, uh, but I, I thought that that perhaps looking at some of these uh, some of the, these new groups. That perhaps uh, you know, looking back at what uh, Victor Witz's book in 2004, Islamic Activism, and, and looking at you, you have all these different organizations, and the background noises. They're going to compete with one another. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to develop. Some are going to develop rapidly. Some of them are going to die out. They're going to change names. The, they're going to. We should be maybe looking at it as a, as as a as a social movement uh, fueled by an ideology, which is a new kind of social movement because it it goes across, you know. Uh, cultures and and geography and and these little groups. The problem is that there's so many of them that 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 the issue could be that you know out of the Ansars of the various type, you know, you get you know a dozen of them and maybe four of them become really powerful. And uh, Alan Cullison told me that you know he thought that that the only the only reason that Al Qaeda stayed together was because they they were able to invent the United States as a as an enemy, you know, because it was so fractious. But but we were the enemy, and they couldn't they didn't have to do much to invent us. So I mean that social movement theory, which have organizations that are part of this, I, th I think might be a, another opening to to right. look at. 
So, so, so let me brief, briefly address those two. So with respect to uh, Hamas, it seems pretty clear that in, during the Oslo period, there was a really clear difference of opinion within Hamas leadership about whether what they should be pushing for is basically um, uh, participation in Oslo and kind of a multi-generational truce by which their superior governance would eventually win out over the Palestinian population, at which point you could reopen the issue. And people on the outside who didn't like, who disagreed. The control over the military wing was never in question, though, and so it acted more or less uh, at, at the, you know, kind of following the political theory of the people on the outside. Since then, how Hamas has, seems to have maintained such cohesion is uh, because they have such a large social service provision system, they're just very good at picking people, right? And they have lots of opportunity to evaluate people before they ever come in. And lots of places where you can go once your utility as an active operative is gone. And, and that's given them a level of cohesion that when they came into government, they brought with them. And so we're able to we're able to hold things together fairly well. Uh, I, I think with respect to um, uh, with respect to the the second question, I think the um, there have been times in history before when we have seen ideological movements that spark violence on a worldwide scale and spark lots of groups that kind of flock to the broad banner of that movement, and they burn themselves out after. 20 or, or, or years or so, unless they get a large state supporting them. So if you think about the anarchist movement, um, they killed many, many more political leaders than uh, the jihadist movement has done in many more countries around the world in the kind of 30 years that they were active from you know, 1890 to 1920. But they kind of faded out, right? The left-wing revolutionary movement lasted much longer. But part of that was because you had the Soviet Union, which was funding it and providing kind of a sense that it could work. And then you had the anti-colonial revolutions in which kind of you had the utility of this movement re-emphasized in lots of places around the world. I think we should be careful, though, in uh, assuming that groups which flock to the banner of a movement are doing so because they actually believe it. Right? If the anti-colonial movement were happening now, surely many of the organizations would call themselves Islamist. Not because they actually believe in the doctrine, but because that was a way you could get money. In the same way, calling yourself Marxist was a way you could get money in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and so I think it's, I, I guess it's a way of saying, this is not, I think, something unprecedented. And in the past, it's just tragically taken a long time for these things to burn out. OK, with that, um, we will end this. Jake, th thanks very much for being here. Bruce, Will, we really appreciate you taking the time. It's a great book. You should buy it and read it. Um, and last, the last point I want to make is that I just think it's really important that uh, we here in the policy community in Washington reach out to academics like Jake that are not directly part of this community, but that are doing really good, relevant work. And so I'd encourage everybody to sort of look to those sources uh, for guidance and ideas. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good